Hello, as an introduction to one of our presentations, I'll open with a little background on myself, John Tabraham. All those years ago, I followed my father and his father into an apprenticeship in shipbuilding at the Walker Naval Yard. This would lead to a career in the offshore oil and gas industry. On retirement, an interest in local history pulled me back to my boyhood days growing up in Benmo. As a member of the St James's Heritage and Environment Group, I am surrounded by like-minded individuals who have an interest in researching and recording the West End of Newcastle's history. As part of this year's Big History event, my contribution follows a history of two cinemas that operated within touching distance of our St James's base. Hi everyone, John Tabraham here. I grew up in Benwell during the 1950s. We lived in Beach Street opposite Jennings Bakery and with Adelaide Terrace at the bottom of our street. Memories of my weekly visits to two of the local cinemas has led to this presentation. Surprisingly, both of the cinemas were on the same street, Condicum Road. Researching the history of the Grand and the Majestic has provided me with an enjoyable walk down memory lane. Here's hoping there's something in here for you too. We start with the older cinema, the Grand Cinema Palace, opened on the 7th of August 1911. The variety magazine of the day, the Bioscope, would tell us the cinema meets with great favour from the people of the district. And what about Benwell at the time? Here we see a quiet looking Adelaide Terrace around about 1910. It's a period of horse drawn carts and trams. In the background you can see St James's Church and the new cinema would be at the junction of Adelaide Terrace and Condicum Road. We continue with some 1911 Benwell facts. The Armstrong factories and others were making vast profits. However, poverty was common in Benwell, mainly as a result of low wages and irregular work. Most working class housing would in the main be described as slums. There were no free health care and infectious diseases were rife, often claiming many lives at a very young age. Back to our 1911 cinema and we find out the films or movies as the Americans call them are silent and need a small orchestra to create an atmosphere. Additionally, the films are short, usually 30 minutes. And to fill out the entertainment, there would also be one or two variety acts. Here we see some of the early films and the stars they produced. From the bottom right and moving clockwise, we see an early version of Frankenstein and The Wizard of Oz. Then a young Mary Pickford, followed by Charlie Chaplin, and finally the Keystone Cops. The success of the early films would lead to the building of many new cinemas. The opening of the Grand Cinema Palace would be a welcome house of entertainment for the Benmull population. From this write-up, we determined the cinema was tastefully built with the internal decor in the ornate Louis Quince style. Seating could accommodate over 600. And we note the cinema was fully equipped for all vaudeville interludes. The owners were shown as John Grantham and Eddie Kant. However, within 18 months, 
Grantham would be operating on his own, having bought out Kant. And here we have the owner of the ground, Mr. John Grantham. An early cinema entrepreneur, Grantham lived at 48 Ferndale Road, Benmore. John Grantham was from Blythe. His father appears to have been at the forefront of early cinema. Here we see early references to his shows in Blythe. Scott's Fono animated pictures are meeting with success here. And in 1906, a new series of pictures is displayed on the Gaty Bioscope. You could say John Grantham was brought up in the cinema. Rob Roy would be an early film shown at the Grand. At 2,500 foot, this film would run for 40 minutes. Rob Roy was an elaborate production. During the picture, bagpipes and drums were played. After the film, the Northumberland Veterans Highland Band performed. The Adena Troupe demonstrated Scottish dancing. Grantham knew how to pull in the audiences. Here we see two advertisements relating to the variety end of the shows. The stage magazine tells us Leone Clark and his 200 cats are appearing at the Grand. That's an awful lot of cats. And the Evening Chronicle in 1913 portrays the Grand as Benwell's premier picture and variety house, whilst at the same time looking for professional artists. It's 1914 and the Grand has been in business for three years. This piece in the Bioscope magazine gives notice to two points of interest. One, John Grantham is now active in local politics after being elected a councillor. And two, he is showing quality long story films at his picture palace. As the article says, he meets with great favour from the people in the district. The films meeting with great favour were these two European made silence, the Spanish made Spartacus and the Swedish drama Give Us This Day. In 1914, Britain is at war with Germany and locally, 800 men of the 4th Battalion of the Yorkshire Regiment are stationed in Elswick Works School. John Grantham would help the war effort by providing free shows for these troops and many others. The war is over and we have a presentation at the Grand. A local lad, James Johnson from Hugh Gardens is a holder of the Victoria Cross, received for rescuing wounded soldiers in France. Lieutenant Johnson was presented with 100 guineas and a handsome timepiece, a gift from the people of the district. Grantham was a great benefactor to the working class and the poor of the West End. This article sees him distributing thousands of Christmas stockings to children throughout the area, in addition to those in hospital. World War I would impact the growth of the European film industry, allowing Hollywood to become the main distributor of films in Britain during the 1920s. American film stars such as Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, Greta Garbo and Rudolph Valentino would become household names here and around the rest of the world. A fire at the cinema in 1929 would see the call out of the fire brigade. A report that the fire started at the stage end would point the finger at the variety performers 
or a member of staff. Smoking being the probable cause. The ground would close for several days to action the repairs. As well as being a cinema owner, John Grantham was heavily involved in local politics. Prior to becoming Lord Mayor in 1936, Grantham would sell the ground to a small northern circuit known as Hinge Productions. Hinge Productions were a company more known for variety than cinema. Throughout the 1930s, the Grand functioned as both a variety show venue and a cinema. To accommodate the new talking films, a sound system would be installed in 1937. A typical Hinge production, it's Treasure Isle in 1936, with wages to pay for 15 of a cast, an orchestra and staff, you had to get the punters through the door. And here's one of the backroom boys, it's the oil man, doing a spot of maintenance. In 1928 John Grantham had installed a generator and was producing his own electricity for a pound a week. The excellent book Cinemas of Newcastle by Frank Manders tells us about another worker, Doug Gibson. Doug started work at the Grand in 1937 as a rewind lad, working with the film projectionists. As there were also periods of variety, he would also double up as a general dog's body. One of his tasks would be to operate the stage lighting. If he made a mistake, he had to go to the artist's room and be subject to a severe dressing down. The bottom picture shows a typical projectionist team operating at the Queen's in 1932. In variety circles, the Grand was notorious for its tough audiences. Bell Reed, the actress, remembers playing the Grand in 1937. In her autobiography, she remembers a hard baptism. The orchestra pit was wired in. I mean, there was wire over the top of the orchestra because of all the things the audience threw at the artists. As the axe came on, there was a lady walking about the gallery, selling razor blades. Razor blades, razor blades, buy me razor blades. The 1940s would lead to the decline of the Grand. The Second World War and the years following had in general seen the demise of variety. Austerity and lack of investment would lead to the rundown of many of the smaller local cinemas. The Majestic, just across the road, was a larger and more modern venue which had access to a far greater selection of quality films than those available to Hinge Productions. The Grand would only survive by becoming a B-movie venue. Yippee I -E, Yippee I O. It's 1940s, B movies, cowboy section. Action packed and the good guy always wins. John Wayne was an A lister, but he also made many B movies. Hopalong Cassidy was acted by William Boyd, and his horse was called Topper. Roy Rogers was King of the Cowboys. His horse was called Trigger and he also had a dog called Bullet. Gabby Hayes made his living as a sidekick to the other stars. In the 40s and 50s, if you saw a cowboy film, invariably Gabby would have a part. Your main B picture would be supplemented by cartoons. 
it's fair to say all of these cartoon characters are still popular today. Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny, Donald Duck, Woody Woodpecker, Sylvester, I thought I'd do a booty cat, and Popeye. Here we have four of the comedy favourites from the 40s. Through a series of short films, these acts entertained British audiences throughout World War II. Old Mother Riley was actually a man, Arthur Lucan, playing an Irish washerwoman. The Bowery Boys were a bunch of New York wise guy youths constantly falling down in their money-making scams. Abbott and Costello were an American comedy act who graduated from radio into films. And George Formby was an English ukulele playing singer of comical songs who became the UK's highest paid entertainer. With little investment and competition from other cinemas in the West End, the Grand would limp along before finally closing its doors on the 26th of September 1956. The cinema building would become Feroda House, owned by Feroda Limited, who were brake lining manufacturers. In 1962, the outlet is still in operation before it finally succumbs to the demolition bulldozer. In this final slide on the Grand, an older generation remembers the cinema on social media. The word lop is slang for fleas. In other words, in its latter years, the Grand Cinema Palace had become a flea pit. In the early 50s, we called it the Loppy Opera. It was well named the Lop. Most seats had lost their fixings to the floor. We liked the Grand better than the Madge. It was much cheaper and we could stamp our feet when the film broke. Sad the cinema at the Loppy Opera listened to the generator going. Memories. Had some great times in the lop. Mrs Sweeney used to be on the till. She lived in Sutton's dwellings, like me. Sixteen years after the opening of the Grand Cinema Palace, a theatre opened on Condigam Road. Almost opposite the Grand, 1927 would see the arrival of the Majestic Theatre. The theatre was built as an ambitious endeavour to bring the players of the day to the suburbs of working class Benmore. With a capacity of 1400, the large theatre was built in the neoclassic style. Inside, the theatre was decorated in a florid classical style in a luxurious deep red gold and black colour scheme. As a backup, the theatre would be built with cinema projection facilities. And here's the surprise. The theatre is built by John Grantham, the owner of the Grand Cinema opposite. The Majestic Theatre opened on the 23rd of October 1927 as a live theatre with a comedy review off the door. The audience would associate with this comedy review in a period of widespread unemployment, I guess all you could do was laugh. January 1928 sees the Christmas pantomime, Tommy Tucker, still in full swing. The Stage Magazine gives a review highlighting many entertaining scenes. In 1928, John Grantham would form a successful association 
with the Denville Stock Company. They had a repertoire of comedies and dramas that would be changed out on a weekly or fortnightly basis. A typical majestic theatre billboard shows a presentation of The Shake by the famous Donville Stock Company. Despite all the talk of the theatre's success, the Majestic would make the change to a cinema in 1930. Grantham was now running two cinemas on the same street. He has 2,000 seats to fill. He opens with a John Wayne talkie. Wayne is out of his cowboy gear and plays a submariner. This is the start of Grantham's local government aspirations. Added responsibilities see him selling the Majestic to the Union Cinema Circuit. The photograph tells us the Majestic is now part of the Union Cinema Circuit. The Benwell Majestic is now managed from a London-based head office. Two Evening Chronicle advertisements give us an insight to the films that the World War II Benwell audiences would be queuing up for. A newly renovated cinema would be showing Edel Flynn and Olivia de Havilland in The Adventures of Robin Hood. A month later, it's Let Freedom Ring, a cowboy with Nelson Eddy, Virginia Bruce and Victor McLachlan. Moving on through the 40s, and the Majestic is now part of the ABC circuit, who operate over 400 cinemas throughout Britain. Still in the 40s, and here's another local lad. Malcolm McPherson grew up in Maple Street, just off Scotswood Road. He was taken on at the Majestic as a trainee aged 14 straight from school in 1946. He stayed there for three years and became a projectionist, earning a respectable one pound, one shilling and sixpence a week. Malcolm would tell us, all the trainees start at 10 in the morning and would prepare the cinema for the evening opening by scrubbing floors and polishing sidelines. There were often film tapes that snapped in the projector and once, a film reel caught fire because the tapes were so flammable. But luckily, we always kept buckets of sand and water in the projection room. We move into the 1950s. It's the heyday of cinema, with Technicolor and Cinemascope. And look at the movies we have. Rebel Without a Cause, 1955, James Dean and Natalie Wood. There's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, 1954. Kirk Douglas and James Mason. Lady and the Tramp, 1955. Larry Roberts and Peggy Lee. And The King and I, 1956. Yul Brynner, Deborah Kerr. Shall we dance, shall we dance, shall we dance? Mrs. Rankin was a cleaner at the Majestic. On a Saturday morning, she would double up by overseeing the children's ABC Miners matinee. As a regular member, I should be somewhere in the picture. ABC Miners Club would take place throughout Britain every Saturday morning in the 1950s. Here's some of the badges we like to wear. And following is the song we sang. I am shout and we think we like to love and have a sing song.
Despite the magnificent films produced during the 1950s, cinema attendances would be in decline. There would be various reasons for this. Living conditions improved. The cinemas were no longer warmer and more comfortable than the homes of the patrons. Through wartime and the days of austerity, cinema owners did not spend money on redecorating. Many of the smaller suburban venues became dowdy and unattractive. The wartime doubling of entertainment tax had an obvious financial cost for the owners to find. Stricter safety regulations would also lead to the closure of some cinemas. The introduction of commercial television, however, would have the biggest impact to cinema attendances. Time Tees began operating in 1959 and in 1960 we see seven Newcastle cinemas closed, followed by another seven in 1961. And here we have it, as recorded by the Evening Chronicle, the Majestic is one of the 1961 closures. 600 ABC miners attend a free final showing. The advent of television combined with the high unemployment of the area has signalled the death knell of the cinema. Following the kids show, the manager, Mr Daniel Ramsey, would close the doors for the last time. We turn to social media for some majestic memories. I saw Jailhouse Rock at the Majestic, as well as going every Saturday to the matinees with five pence of sweets from Gibson's Corner Store, which was on the corner of Gill Street and Colston Street. I remember going on a Saturday morning and queuing up outside. Afterwards, going to the ice cream parlour for a chocolate ice cream. Probably about 1957. I can still remember the smell of the place. I thought it was palatial. All red plush and shining brass. We used to stand outside and ask strangers to take us in because air films needed adult permission. Can you imagine that today? Allowing your kids to stand outside a picture house and asking a total stranger to take them in. God, I did it. And it scares me when I think about it. Kids show on a Saturday, 6p admission. We were known as the miners of the ABC. It was late 1950s. During the 1960s, the majestic building would make a return to the entertainment business, this time as a venue for bingo. This 1994 photograph sees the bingo tables laid out ready for the incoming customers. Looking up to the upper circle still manages to take us back to the glory days when the majestic theatre and cinema played to full houses. The majestic theatre would, as part of the West End Regeneration Scheme, finally be demolished in May of 2004. We end by paying tribute to the publicly minded John Grantham, Lord Mayor of Newcastle, a true entrepreneur and hero of Benmore, the man who built two theatres on Connegham Road. <laughs>